stand with me and receive God's call to worship. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hands. Amen. Well, would you please take your hymnals and uh, turn with me to hymn number 34, hymn number 34, Stand Up and Bless the Lord. Stand up and bless the Lord, ye people of his joys. Stand up and bless the Lord your God with hearts and soul and voice. Though high above all praise, above all Sing I, who would not fear his holy name and praise and magnify. O Lord, the living flame from his own altar brought to touch our lips. Our minds in smile and wing to have a thought. Our strength and song and his salvation us, then be his love in Christ proclaim with all our ransom pause. Stand up and bless the Lord. Your God adore. Stand up and bless his glorious name and for forever. Would you join your hearts and minds with me in prayer? At the um, end of our prayer, we'll be praying together the Lord's Prayer, and you can find the words we use on page 456 in the blue Psalters. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, glorious, mighty, you are the conquering King and also our loving Heavenly Father. We come to you tonight and we thank you for the day that you have given us, a day of worship a day of enjoying you and of your people. We thank you for feeding us this morning from your word. And Lord, we pray that you would do so again this evening. We thank you for encouraging us with conversation, especially conversation about you and practically filling us with food to sustain our bodies. We thank you for giving us this day free of our worldly cares that we might rest and no refreshment, that we might be enabled all the more to live for you and, and serve you in our vocations 
in the week to come. Lord, you are truly good to us and provide for all our needs. And having thanked you for these things, we would now come and bring our requests before you. And we would ask, as you have told us to ask, that our government might be established in righteousness. We ask this because we want to live quiet and holy lives. We ask this because we want to have the freedom to proclaim your truth for the salvation of souls. We ask this because it would be for your glory that the powers that be which really reign on your behalf, uh, that they should reign in obedience to your laws rather than against them. And so, Lord, we do ask this. We pray that the members of Parliament would be constrained to make laws that are righteous. We pray, Lord God, that you might even work a mighty thing and convert many of them. We pray for our king as his coronation approaches. And Lord, we hear that there might even be tensions where he is seeking to take away from the coronation service as it explicitly recognizes you as the one and only true God and his reign as from you. Lord, we pray that you would stop this and even that you might use it to help our kings see that you are not just an idea that is helpful to humanity, but you are the true and living God that he must one day bow before and to whom he owes allegiance. We pray that you might convert him and his family and that this might be to the great blessing of our nation. We pray, Lord God, for churches up and down our land, and we pray that you would cause there to be clarity, clarity on the truth of your word, clarity of doctrine. We pray that there might be holiness of life, that the church in this nation might again shine as lights in a dark world, might be that salt which preserves the culture around it, and that you might use our faithfulness in the uncertain and difficult times that we find ourselves in to do much good for your glory. Lord, we also pray uh, that you would help each one of us in the particular vocations that you have given us. There are many represented here, and we pray that you would give us what we need to act honorably, to uh, work in such a way that shows that we value uh, the work that you have given us, that we recognize that work itself isn't bad, but it is something that you have given us to do. We pray, Lord God, that we might in this way be an example and a witness to those whom we work with. We pray for those of us whose work is in the home, that you would uh, strengthen and give much grace. Lord, we also pray that you would strengthen the hand of the organizations that are represented amongst us. We think of the CI and their important work of speaking to members of parliament and the government, of educating churches on how public policy is 
uh, interfacing with with truth and error according to your word. And we pray that you would greatly uh, strengthen this organization and that you would use it as a powerful force to strengthen your church. We pray also uh, for Lovewise in a similar way and also uh, for TPAC that you would use that organization for the salvation of of many uh, little lives. Lord, we we thank you for the members of our congregation who serve in these various organizations, and we pray that you would encourage them and uh, use them in their particular roles. Father, we raise up all these things now before you, and we pray as you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, please uh, take your psalm books and turn with me to Psalm 96a, him, uh, sorry, Psalm 96a, and we are singing together verses 7 to 13. Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and beginning in verse 26. We are returning uh, this evening to the Great Commission later in our service, and in some ways, as I'll mention briefly, the Great Commission is um, Christ uh, taking up what God initially gave to Adam, this 
commission uh, to take dominion and to multiply. Uh, so we're going to read this original uh, commission in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Would you take your psalters again and turn with me this time to Psalm uh, 78. Psalm uh, 78, which can be found on page 101. We've sung previously of a call to all nations to ascribe glory uh, to the Lord, uh, that, that call that goes out to the nations, that they should come and be the Lord's and, and in a sense be discipled by his people unto the glory of God. And now we're going to sing of a different sort of um, evangelism and discipleship, and that is what happens in the home uh, between parents and their children. So let's sing to God's praise. We're singing Psalm 78, verses 1 to 6. please turn with me in Scripture to Matthew 28, the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 28. We'll begin the reading in verse 16, but before we do so, Let's ask for God's help. 
Lord God, we are unable, apart from your Holy Spirit, to learn from and to benefit from your word. So we pray now that you would greatly help us, that your word would be living and active amongst us, that it would convict and that it would train, train unto righteousness and call unto your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Those of you who were with us on Easter Sunday will know that I preached from Matthew 28, and also that I am between uh, evening sermon series. And so I've taken this opportunity to, to preach uh, something out of the norm and to return to this passage because it's something that I've been thinking about more recently. And in particular, I want to draw out the idea of making disciples, of making disciples. So really, I'm going to be focusing on verse 19 and the beginning of verse 20. Verse 19 and the beginning of verse 20. This commission here that Christ gives as the one with all authority in heaven and on earth to his disciples, this commission is the mission of the worldwide church. But we, here at All Saints Presbyterian Church, we're a part of that worldwide church, and therefore uh, this is our mission as well. It speaks to us and, and applies to us here in our particular circumstance. Why would we uh, look at this apart from the fact that Christ has given it to us? Well, part of the reason, surely, is that by reminding ourselves of the things that we know, that we might be refocused on the task that Christ has given us, and also that we might have a renewed sense of purpose and direction, individually and as a congregation. It should also lead us to God himself for help because none of these things are things that we can do of our own strength. If you don't know Christ tonight, if you aren't in a, a living relationship with him, this sermon hopefully will give you a clear sense of what we are about at All Saints Presbyterian Church, and so you will be under no illusions about these things. So then this passage gives us the what of what Christ has called his church worldwide to do and the how, the what and the how particularly of making disciples. That's my title this evening, Making Disciples. And my points are go and make disciples, point one, Point two, baptism, and point three, teaching. The first point is the what, and the second two points are the how. So, we have this mission from Christ himself to go and to make disciples. This is what the church is to be doing in the world. 
And this is the command that Christ gives his disciples. And it's a command that is deeply rooted in God's work of redemption in this world. I mentioned earlier in our service that God told Adam to go take dominion and to multiply. He told that to Adam and Eve. And Adam failed. As many of you know, he failed to, to do this task as God had commanded him to do. And so Christ comes as this last Adam, as the second Adam, to take up this task of taking dominion of the world and multiplying God's people. Now, we are not Christ, but we do share in his mission. And our part, our part in Christ uh, taking dominion over this world and multiplying worshipers of God is to make disciples. That is what he is saying as the new Adam, as the one who has authority in heaven and on earth from his Father. We are to make disciples. Now, to understand that, we need to think a little bit about what discipleship is. What is discipleship? Well, it is a whole life commitment to a master and his teaching. It's a whole life commitment to a master and his teaching. Think of Jesus as he walked there on the side of the sea and called his disciples. Many of you know the stories, your children will remember the stories as he spoke to James and John and to others, and he said, come, follow me. He was saying, not just join my club, not just, uh, you know, spend a, a little time with me. What was he saying? He was saying, leave your families, leave your livelihood, Come live with me and learn from me. Learn from me in the context of every day, of all of my life. It's a little bit like the way apprenticeship used to work. Now you have an apprenticeship like a job or something like that, but it didn't used to be like that. A hundred years ago, a couple hundred years ago, an apprentice would go and live in the house of the, the master craftsman, and uh, he would learn from him all sorts of things, uh, things to do with the trade that they were learning, but also things to do with, with life. It was, a, it was a whole life commitment, and that's the way discipleship is. It's a whole life commitment. So it's not just about being a student. It's not just about learning things, but it's about change in one's entire life. But more than that, when Christ says, make disciples, he is not only talking about the process of sanctification and becoming more like him, but he's, he's also talking about what we would call evangelism, going out and calling people to Christ. And so he's talking about a package which begins when someone is called to Christ and goes on throughout the rest of their lives as they are shaped and formed by Christ through his word and by his spirit. As they are trained in righteousness, in biblical thinking and living. And I submit to you that this is of particular importance today. Particular importance in the context in which we live. We live in a pluralistic society which has all sorts of ideas about how we are to live, about what is truth. And we live in an increasingly anti-Christian society. 
where we might have expected society to generally back up the values and ideas that we find in Scripture, maybe a hundred years ago or something like that, we can no longer count on this. And so, for the average Christian, you, I, need to be thoroughly trained in what we believe and how we are to live it out if we are to really be Christ in this context in which we live. On Thursday, John and I went to a, a wonderful lecture that was put on by the CI on critical uh, theory, uh, an idea, a group of ideas that has infiltrated our, our culture in, in powerful ways and is behind much of uh, the um, identity politics and other craziness that's going on in our society. And one of the questions that was asked was, how did we get to this place? Uh, how did we get to a point where uh, crazy things were being said, like, like that a, a man can become a woman or something like that? Part of the answer, surely, is that the church has not been discipling its people. And, and that was brought out, actually, in that session, uh, that there was a whole generation of, of people who were truly one for Christ. Uh, but the focus was so narrowly on the doctrines of salvation that then they went out into life and into social work, into other things, and, and they just imbibed teaching from the world and they didn't consistently apply their, their biblical faith to all of life, and therefore they have been susceptible to all sorts of wrong and worldly thinking. This is why the church has not been speaking plainly and clearly to our culture over the last several decades in particular. Discipleship, therefore, is of particular importance today. And discipleship is the only way we will be equipped to be salt and light in this world, to really be a preserving influence in it and a beacon of, of truth in an increasingly confused time. More importantly even, discipleship is necessary for the glory of God we read in the Gospel of John that God is glorified when Christ's disciples bear much fruit. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As our lives are discipled unto Christ, this is how we glorify God in the world. And those who claim Christ but are just like the world or don't really know what they believe or why they believe it and how it is different than what the world believes, Christians like that will not really be able to let their light shine before men that the world may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. So do you see that discipleship isn't only about standing firm in a culture which is increasingly going away from Christ, but it's also about bringing glory to our Father in heaven. It's what enables us to do this. Discipleship is not optional. It's vital for us to fulfill our purpose and what is our purpose but to glorify and to enjoy our God? However, discipleship is not limited to strengthening the believer and helping him live consistently in this world. The command here is to go and make disciples. Disciples must be called. 
You will know Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Disciples must be called. And here in our passage, Christ says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This tells us that the gospel is not bound to one culture. He says, disciple all the ethne, disciple all the nations. Here is our great foundation for for missions, for, for going out to those who do not know Christ. This is also reminding us that there is no one above or below the gospel. The gospel is to all. And this means that Christ's church is to be outward looking, outward looking both locally and internationally. We are to be not just in our holy little huddle becoming more like Christ, but we are to be those drawing others in to be more like Christ with us, to join in this process of discipleship. We are to be making disciples. Of course, this also applies to families, as I implied by one of our psalm things, that within many of our families we have covenant children who have not yet closed with Christ, and therefore making disciples is not only a matter of of going out onto Northumberland Street, but also a matter of speaking with our children as we rise up and as we go to bed, as we walk along the way, bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. This command is to the church. It was originally given to the apostles. And this, on the one hand, should free you you don't have to do it all. In any organization, one individual person can't fully fulfill its mission. They're part of a larger team, and it's like that with the church. We, as the church, have been given this mission to go and make disciples, but we're all going to have a different part in that. This is implied even in what Paul says about the church. We're a body. We have different parts. Not all of us are hands or or heads or eyes or, or feet, but we all have different parts. And so, this should should free you, but it should also focus you. If you are a part of the church, then you are to be a part of this mission in one way or another. You are to be involved in the ministry of the church. You are to be involved, yes, according to your gifts, according to your circumstances, but to be involved. So, All Saints Presbyterian Church, what are we to be about in Newcastle? Well, in part, surely it is making disciples, and we may further refine that in various ways, but as we're part of the worldwide church, this is also our mission to be making disciples for the glory of God, for the praise and honor of His glorious grace. Now, this passage gives us two tools in pursuing this mission. And the first is my second point, which is baptism. Now, you may be wondering, how is baptism a tool of discipleship? How is baptism a tool of discipleship? Well, to answer that, let's consider very briefly what baptism is. The first thing we learn from this text is that in baptism, The baptized person has God's name put upon them. Verse 19, baptizing them in the name 
of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or it could be translated baptizing them into the name. And this is the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name of, of the covenant God. God often was referred to as the name in the Old Testament. And here, as many of you will know, name is singular, but then we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is one of the clearest places where we see the oneness and, and threeness of our triune God in Scripture. The point, though, is that the name of this triune covenant God is put on someone in baptism. And it's not just a name tag. It's a mark of relationship. This is a covenantal idea, this idea of into the name. We are brought into relationship with God. We submit to Him, and in return we receive all of His benefits. God relates to His people by the covenant of grace, this covenant uh, that is ultimately based on what Jesus Christ has done in His life and death and resurrection and not what we do. He is the mediator of this covenant. And baptism signifies and seals this. So Galatians 3 verse 27 can say, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This name and being connected to this name also speaks of ownership. Baptism is a mark of ownership. The name being put on us engages us to be the Lord's. We are marked out as His. Has any of you been out in rural parts of our country and, and seen sheep that are marked with different colors. They're spray painted, uh, the modern equivalent of what Nathan was talking of this morning. And it's the same idea. It's marking those sheep out as belonging to someone. Well, baptism is, is like that. Our catechism summarizes the meaning of baptism like this. This is the larger catechism. The question is, what is baptism? And the answer is, is baptism is a sacrament of the New Covenant, New Testament, wherein Christ hath ordained the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost to be a sign and seal of ingrafting into Himself, of remission of sins by His blood, these are the, the benefits that we receive, and regeneration by His Spirit, of adoption and resurrection unto everlasting life and whereby the parties baptized are solemnly admitted into the visible church and enter into an open and professed engagement to be holy and only the Lord's. That's the idea of ownership and our entering into it. When someone is baptized, God's name is put upon them. They are outwardly joined to Him, and their baptism symbolizes their receiving all of His saving benefits in Christ. They are also engaged to be His. It's a picture of the gospel. Now, it's true that sometimes uh, all these spiritual benefits are not applied at the same time as baptism. We baptize covenant children, and that doesn't mean that they automatically get these things, but the Spirit applies them sovereignly in His own timing, and sometimes not at all. There's, there's not an unbreakable connection between these things, but nonetheless, it is a real picture of the gospel. How then does this help us in making disciples? Well, for one, 
it marks a clear line between the visible church, those who profess Christ, and the world. It, it makes a clear line around the visible church. And thus, it witnesses to all those who are not baptized that they have no part in Christ. It is a very visible way of saying that if you are not baptized, that you have no part in Christ. Now, there's rare exceptions that thief on the cross was never baptized, but in general, this is true. And therefore, it is a call to them that they are without hope in this world, that they are without Christ. Even for baptized covenant children or or adults who have been baptized but are not walking with the Lord. This is a call to you. You, as it were, carry around with you a gospel presentation. You have received the sign and the seal of baptism, and so you go around with a gospel presentation fixed to you. And you, by your baptism, have been engaged to be the Lord's. So the question for you is not, are you outside and will you come in, in a sense, but will you be a traitor to Christ? Christ has already claimed you. Will you be a traitor to him? Or will you embrace the engagement that has been made for you? Will you embrace it by repenting for yourself and believing on Christ for yourself. This is why it is a more solemn thing to walk away from Christ as a baptized person than it is to have never been a part of the visible covenant people of God. So there is a a clear line. And secondly, there is a call. A call to those who are outside and a call to those who have been baptized but do not truly, really, spiritually know Christ. It's also a means of bringing those outside into the covenant community. When someone as an adult is, is baptized, then they are making that conscious decision to sign up in the Lord's army, as it were, to engage themselves to the Lord. And if the church does its job as it should, then preparing one for baptism is is a wonderful way to, to go through and explain the gospel. In all these ways, baptism is a, is a wonderful tool of discipleship. But even after one passes from death to life by the work of the Holy Spirit, our baptism should still instruct us and call us to greater discipleship. And here, our catechism is, again, very, very helpful. There's a question in the larger catechism that says, how is our baptism to be improved by us? This is a bit of a long paragraph, but bear with me as I go through it. The needful but much neglected duty of improving our baptism is to be performed by us all our life long, especially in the time of temptation and when we are present at the administration of it to others. So we, we are to remember our baptisms and to use it particularly when we're being tempted or when we're witnessing baptisms. And how are we to do it? We're to do it by serious and thankful consideration of the nature of it, of what it points us to, of the gospel, of everything that we receive in Christ, and of the ends for which Christ instituted it, our being brought into his church and it being a means of our salvation, the privileges and benefits conferred and sealed thereby, and our solemn vow made therein, by being humbled for our sinful defilement. Baptism signifies our cleansing 
uh, spiritually by the Holy Spirit, and therefore it implies that we, by nature, are defiled, are falling short of it, and walking contrary to it, to the grace of baptism and our engagements. By growing up to assurance of pardon of sin and of all other blessings sealed to us in that sacrament. So it's to encourage us to seek the assurance of the things which it points to. And by drawing strength from the death and resurrection of Christ into whom we are baptized for the mortifying of sin and quickening of grace. So as we are joined to Christ, and His baptism points us to that, this is our power for overcoming sin. It's to remind us of that. It's to, to strengthen us in our fight with sin by endeavoring to live by faith, to have our conversation in holiness and righteousness. That's our lives in holiness and righteousness as those that have therein given up their names to Christ and to walk in brotherly love as being baptized by the same Spirit into one body. So we could spend a whole sermon just exegeting that, but, but you see there, there are all sorts of ways that our baptism helps us as we fight with sin, as we, as we seek to follow the Lord in this life, as, as we grow in discipleship. The nature of baptism shows us how it ought to be a tool of discipleship. We see this in that we are baptized into the name of God. It, it points us into being brought into relationship with God through Christ, and thus points us to the gospel. Baptism functions as a marker of the visible covenant community of Christ, and thus calls the world to Christ, and calls those who are part of the covenant community, but not inwardly Christ, to repentance and faith. And it points to the gospel for all of us, and we should use this to be reminded of it and our commitments to Christ. We need to recover baptism as a significant tool of discipleship in the church and in our lives. So if you're here and you're an unbeliever tonight, then feel this call that if, if you do not have this mark, that you are without hope in this world. This is a call to you to close with Christ. Covenant children, feel the weight of the responsibility that is upon you. You have been engaged to be Christ. It is your responsibility to grow up into that engagement. You have no other option. It is what God is calling you to do. Seek Him for the true spiritual reality of your baptism, that it might be applied to you. Are we as a congregation praying for more baptisms, that we might use them as means of discipleship? Are we praying that God would make the baptisms of our covenant children effective? Parents, are you, are you using your children's baptisms to remind them of, of their engagement, of, of the gospel that has been uh, put upon them, as it were, that they must embrace for themselves? What about your own baptism? Are you letting it point you to Christ? Are you reminding others of their baptism in their times of temptation and of trial? Baptism is, is one of the tools that Christ gives us here for discipleship. But the next tool, my third point, is teaching. In verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And this is more obvious as to how it is a means of discipleship. So I want to focus on the what, what we are to teach in order to show how useful of a tool it is, and the who, who is to teach, both to exhort you to receive this tool and also to use it. So the what, we are told 
that the church is to teach all things that I have commanded you. That is, all things that Christ has commanded us. Or it could be translated, all as much as I have commanded you. And I think it's, it's right to generalize here to all of the word of God. We know that it is the spirit of Christ who has inspired all of Scripture. It is Christ by His Spirit that has given us all of Scripture. And so the church is just a disciple by teaching all the Word of God for all of life. All the Word of God for all of life. Our teaching is to include doctrine. Who is God? Who is man? Who is Christ and what has He done? How should we see creation? What does salvation mean? What is the church? Where is this world going? We need to know all of these things and teach all of them in a full Lord way. We need to be teaching ethics. The church, church must teach on marriage, on family, on how to work for the glory of God, how to interact with various ideas in our culture every aspect of life. And this teaching is is not just focused on the head, it is focused on life transformation. Teach them to observe all the things I have commanded to you. To to keep them, it's an ongoing idea of not only receiving these things, but holding on to them. It speaks of a lifestyle. One of the differences between a lecture and a a sermon is that a lecture aims at conveying truth, but a sermon, amongst other things, aims at conveying truth for the purpose of changing lives. And this sort of teaching is more like a sermon. We need to know all these things. We need to know our God, and we need to know these things that we may live faithfully for him in this world. And again, that's incredibly important at this point in our post-Christian society. The fact is, we will either be discipled by the world or we will be discipled by Christ through his church. And this tool that Christ has given us for discipling is teaching, teaching all that the Scriptures say about what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And when we do that, it will ensure that we are discipled by Christ. It will ensure that we are able to stand. It will ensure that we grow in assurance. It will ensure that we grow in knowledge of God and and love of Him. Do you see the usefulness of this? I invite you, if, if you think there's holes in the teaching of our church, if there's things that that you want to know about how the, the Bible applies to this area of life, come and speak to the elders. We would we would love to, to help you understand the implications of of the scriptures for these things, whether that's publicly in, in teaching or in pastoral care. That's the what, but then there's the who. Who is to do this teaching? Well in part, it is, it is elders and ministers. This was originally given to the apostles, but it's also given to them as they represent the church. And here I think Ephesians is, is helpful to us. Ephesians 4, it says, and he himself gave some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But did you notice that he gave pastors and teachers not just so they might do all the equipping, but that they might equip the saints for the work of ministry, so that the saints then minister and further equip. So, 
this teaching is to be done, yes, by me as your minister, by the elders, but we are to be teaching each other. And in our families, husbands are to be teaching their wives and their children. And mothers are be t- to be teaching their children. To do this, we must first of all know Christ. If we don't know him personally, then we will just be teaching a bunch of ideas. We need then also to know the content of the scriptures. We need to know the truth in order that we can pass it on to others. And we need to be intentional. Well, we have responsibilities as elders or fathers or others that we need to be intentional about teaching the truth of God's word. But there's also another application here from this tool of teaching. And that's that you must be receptive to being taught. Listen to 1 Peter 2. It says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. This, this tool for discipleship is for your growth. And that it might be effective, you should be receptive to that. Teaching of God's word is one of the primary means of discipleship that Jesus has given his church. And therefore, if you are his disciple, you should want to receive his word in preaching, in pastoral care, and from others as they speak it truthfully. It is Christ's design for your discipleship and growth. We, as a part of the worldwide church, are to make disciples by baptizing and teaching. Of course, these are supernatural things. We can do all of this outwardly, and it will be of no effect if the Holy Spirit is not in it. What does this mean for us? Well, it it means that we must be evangelistic and outward-looking. Otherwise, we will just devolve into that holy huddle and, and not go out and make disciples. We must take discipleship seriously, remembering and using our baptisms, using baptism as a discipleship tool for new converts and children in the home. We must be a church which applies God's Word to all of life. We must have solid teaching from the front and also within the membership. Why? For your own good? Yes. You will be happier. You will be stronger as Christians. But there's something more for the glory of God. Discipleship isn't just about getting your theology right. It isn't just about applying God's Word to all of your life. It's about you growing in the likeness of Christ now and all of your life, that you might, through all eternity to come, showcase the glories of God's grace in your holiness. May God use our church for that. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would help us join with your church worldwide in pursuing these aims that you have given to us. And we pray that it might be for our strengthening, for our growth, but ultimately for your glory, that we might stand in the evil day, that we might be those from now and forevermore who might be trophies of your grace. We ask it in the name of your Son. Amen.
Would you take your hymnals and turn with me to hymn number 171? Lift up your heads and receive the blessing of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.